So again, from what I was saying, empathy is the first place to begin. Empathy is the place to begin. Um, nothing, nothing will, you know, beat that. Nothing will come in front of that. So when you've established that, you're using that to guide yourself all through. Your empathy is what is causing you to start the conversation early. And when something will happen, God forbid, and you know, these things happen whether we like it or not, you already have a rapport with the patient's family. You already have a rapport with the patient. They already know that you care. So when you're coming in and telling them what is happening now, there is already some trust. And the reason why, the reason why I always encourage, and this goes to your next part of the question, the reason why I always encourage that you do that as a primary team is because you understand the general scope of the picture. You have to initiate that. You can't be, you know, worried about having that conversation. You can't, your, their life is already in a way in your hands. So why are you running away from that responsibility? You're already having to care for them. And again, if you can't lead with empathy, you probably will get stuck. And that's why probably a lot of people are scared to have that conversation. If you're clear in your heart that you're leading with empathy, you're putting yourself in their shoes and you're trying to do what is the best. And trying to be as frank as possible, as you know, comforting as you possibly can, it's easy to have that conversation. So, because the primary team has a better grasp of the general clinical picture, I encourage them to have that conversation as opposed to the palliative team. Now, there will be very complicated cases where you know the family doesn't get where you're coming from, and there's a lot of back and forth. Yes, you involve the palliative team. And, and if this is, if there's anybody, any palliative person watching this, for God's sake, know what is happening with the patient before you go and speak to them. That usually pisses me off. I'm, I'm being serious about this. Where the palliative team goes and talks to the patient's family and they don't understand what the prognosis and what's really happening with the patient. And it, a lot of times they're super, super aggressive as to what they're trying to achieve. That's not the point. The point is to communicate with the patient. Ultimately, they make the decisions. We don't make the decisions for them. And I, I, I hate the idea that people think somehow we, 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 we have the patient autonomy and we can make decisions for them and their families. They make the decision. Ultimately, why do you think all that back and forth happens where it's just like extended you know, chaos? It's because we, we know, whether we like it or not, that these people make the decisions. Go, go, go and stop the uh, vent and see what happens. You know, they make that decision. So that's why you involve the ethics committee just trying to you know, cover your behind. We know that ultimately the family makes the decision. So why are we trying to cut them out of the, the conversation? Yes, sometimes they don't... They, they, and again, if you're not dealing with empathy, you miss the entire picture. You understand that grief has so many different stages. He has many different stages. And you expect the family and their loved ones and patients and their loved ones will get into denial at some point. You're not knocking them for that. It's part of the natural process of grief. So when you are not, you realize that they're probably in that stage of denial, you be a little patient with them. And you come out and you know, you know, this this is this is where we are. But again, imagine how meaningful that conversation is if you already started from the beginning. They already know that you're walking with them. They know that you're holding their hands and walking with them through the entire process. You're not trying to, you know, conserve the patients, uh, the hospital resources. That, and again, <laughs> do not remove the humanity of these people, man. Do not remove their humanity for God's sake. Because yes, they lived in, they, somebody found them in maggots and nobody was taking care of them. Who are you to say that they don't deserve, they deserve uh, a chance? Who are you to say that? Oh yeah, they weren't cared for, so their life is worthless anyways, really? We're not leading with empathy, that's terrible. I'm not saying sugarcoat anything. Be as straight up as possible, but know that you, where you're coming from is a place of real, real human connection. 
no way you just for God's sake, put yourself in the shoes. That's why we that's why I'm saying that all the you know over and over again. Put yourself in the shoes and see how you'd feel if you if somebody's trying to game you into making a decision. Because that's what we do all the time. We're, like, we're trying to, you know, come, trying to trick the patient into uh, their families, making them DNA or whatever. See how you'd feel, especially you being an intellectual. You being, you know, you know what you, you know what's going on. You would revolt. So that's the point. That's that's my general on this my general approach to palliative care medicine. Whether it's come from the primary team, when it's whether it's coming from the palliative specialist, empathy has to lead the way through and through. And I think I can't emphasize it more than that, really. Totally agree. Empathy and uh, early conversation. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, made me remember a patient I did have that. Um, the conversation was kind of on board already that, you know, with the whole picture, things are not looking great. Mm. COVID with liver cirrhosis and whatnot, things are not looking great. And then things went south. Things wow. did not go well. Wow. And I had, had to have a conversation with the daughter and I had to get a consent for intubation and uh, all of the procedure. And she looked at me, right? And she, because everything was happening, the family was in the room while we were doing everything. Yeah. So I kind of believe that they kind of already have that trust. And she looked at me. I was yeah. the only one on the primary team, like the primary team. And yeah. then we have the ICU going to take over now. And mm -hmm. then um, uh, to her, and, uh, the patient and the family. Mm -hmm. uh, so she looked at me. I asked the, mother, the patient, the patient deferred the decision to the daughter. And the daughter looked at me and she told, she asked me that uh, if this was your mother, mm -hmm. would you do the same thing? Mm -hmm. Right? And in a pause moment, and because you have to be honest, right? You if have this was to, your mother. You, you I, and I explained to her that, to be honest with the picture I'm looking now, even though things doesn't look like it's a favorable outcome, yeah. I will still give it a try. Because if I do not intervene, what will happen is this is going to go more bad. And if I yeah. still intervene, I just hope it's better. And, you know, she kind of felt at least that uh, uh, the person taking care of her mother also think if this is if it was their mother, they will do the same thing. So she was like, right. she's, she's the right decision for her mother. Yeah. So I think building trust is very it's, important. It, it is very important because it, it was breaking up a little bit of just summar summarizing what you were saying is if, if you can answer genuinely to a patient or their family that if this was you on that other side caring for your mom or you know being on that other side in however way would you do the same thing I think everybody should be able to search their hearts and be able to be as honest as possible to say exactly what they do because you cannot treat your own loved ones differently from another person's loved ones it's it's i think it's 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 it's, it's i'm not trying to be idealistic here or you know trying to be sound perfect but I, it's just human things are human things man you can't you can't wiggle your way around you know empathy and and seeing people for for the human beings they are you know and I think if that leads our conversations when it comes to uh, um, end of life care, uh, it will make a huge difference. Starting early, you know, leading with empathy and making sure that the patient can see that you're working with them, not not you trying to achieve some. You know, I I used to I used to remember um, in residency sometimes where some people would say, "Oh man, I got that patient to uh, patient to be DNR," and without any significant basis. Like, is this because of the prognosis that is significantly out of, you know, reach for any form of intervention or because you just felt like this was going to make your work easier? And a lot of times, I can't judge people, but sometimes it's very apparent. You just want to be able to go home and not worry that that patient goes to the ICU and not worry that if something happens to the patient, you'll have to, you know, that's just not right. Again, I'm not trying to act like, you know, I'm perfect or anybody is, 
But what is what is right is what is right. What is wrong is what is wrong. Whether you 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 do it or not, you just have to be able to 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 be as honest and as uh, as um, as and this is ethics at the end of the day. This is what ethics is about. Your own conduct in the context of another human being's uh, uh, situation. Uh, are you are you are you being true to what what they deserve? You know, and that, that's the way I see it. Anyways, um, I, I think this might be a good place to wrap up this part of the conversation. If if you agree, yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah. All right, Mumba. Uh, just- yeah. Go, go ahead, you're going you're gonna to say something? Uh, I said, you know, uh, end of life care, very, very emotional. I yeah. think one last thing you can offer the patient and their family towards the end of life, life is, you know, letting them spend the last moment together. Oh, oh yeah. my God, that's such a big deal, man. I, I, I've, I've, we've had to break protocols just to allow that to happen. Just yeah. allow that to happen. And nothing will feel more rewarding than that. Nothing will feel more rewarding than loved ones just... just This is... Not, nothing medicine is happening here. Yeah. Nothing medicine is happening here. This is just like... Just a... A, 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 a beautiful human moment. Where yeah. they're just existing in that space and understanding all of the sorrow and horror that is about to come... But they're just existing out of love and connection that they, they share. And I, I think that's beautiful. I think, you know, again, when you go outside of the medicine, when you know you can't do much, just, you know, let, let human moments happen, you know, just give them a chance to spend time. And, you know, I think that's always very beautiful. And thanks, thanks for, to, for, for mentioning that. All right. Um, I think that was a good place to, to, to end this part of the conversation. It's always a pleasure, Mubarak. Um, there's so many things to talk about, man. I don't even... It's just like endless. We could literally sit here and just pick up questions one after the other and just go. But, uh, but we'll stop here for now. Uh, thanks for all of you guys watching. It was, uh, it was, it was nice you know, sharing these thoughts. And um, we'll see you guys in the next video. All right? All right. Keep, being all right. The best, keep being the best clinicians you possibly can. All the best. All right. All right. All right. Bye. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm.